Hey there, welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me my most special guest that I have ever had on the Energy Blueprint Podcast, my brother, Dr. Yoni Witten, who also happens to be my best friend going on 20 plus years now and uh, a, a personal health mentor of mine since I was a little kid, my first health mentor and probably the biggest influence on me the, that actually led me down my whole life and career path trajectory to do what I'm doing now. Uh, so I owe a lot to him. He's also been a, a, an immense source of knowledge for teaching me uh, all kinds of things related to the structure and function of the human body, uh, really since I was 13 years old, uh, which is when he started training me and all this stuff. Um, I, I will read you a little bit uh, about his background or tell you a little bit about his background. So uh, he's got a Bachelor of Kinesiology, a bachelor's degree in kinesiology from San Diego State University. He went on to receive his doctorate of chiropractic from Cleveland Chiropractic College, uh, where he graduated at the top of his class. He spent years researching and studying with experts in manual medicine and rehabilitation from the Czech Republic and with brilliant clinicians in the field of functional neurology in the United States. Uh, he's also one of the first doctors in the United States to be certified as a certified wellness practitioner. And he's been in clinical practice in San Diego for over 15 years, helping thousands of patients resolve their pain. Uh, also, I wanna mention, you know, there's a lot of health experts out there for whom uh, health has been something that, you know, kind of sparked their interest maybe later in life maybe they spent their early period doing you know engineering or journalism or whatever random thing and then later in life had some health struggles that led them to get interested in health and then studied it for a few years wrote a book and something to that effect that's not what's going on here um, with my brother this is someone who has literally since the time he was a kid uh, been just utterly obsessed with the science of the human body, the structure and the function and the performance of the human body. And this is a lifelong obsession for him for almost 30 years now. He's now in his 40s. And um, this is just someone who is a true genius in this area who has been studying this for decades. So, uh, and, and on a personal note, I've just gleaned so much knowledge from, from this man. So I, again, just so excited to welcome to the show my brother, who I've been dying to have on the show for a few years now. Welcome, Yoni. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so you have a lot to live up to the, with the, uh, <laughs> the, the intro I just gave you. You better, yeah. you better perform as a genius. Yeah, the only way from here is down. <laughs> so um, you've got into chronic pain. Obviously, early in our lives, you know, we were both martial artists as, as little kids. We both got into... Uh, weight training and all things related to to performance, but you know, for the last 15 years of your clinical practice, it's been mainly focused on pain. So yes. I want to talk about the science of of pain. I want to talk about, uh, as you call it, the gap between uh, the science of our understanding of pain and what conventional medicine does to try to fix pain. So yes. tell tell me about that landscape so what you said is exactly right there's actually an enormous gap between what science knows about pain and what doctors are doing to treat it the overwhelming problem stems from the fact that m conventional medicine really just doesn't take pain seriously because it's not an imminent threat to a person's health in other words pain is not likely to kill somebody in the foreseeable future it's only likely to make them completely miserable and ruin their quality of life. But since it's not going to kill them, they don't take so much time to actually even figure out what the problem is. So there's kind of this three-step process that I talk about and I, I teach a lot of my patients about that they need to know when they're suffering with pain and they go in to seek conventional medical help for the problem. It's a three-step process. First, they're gonna receive a very quick examination of the painful area. Then they're gonna be shuffled off for some basic imaging. Uh, usually that's an x-ray. Now, if that x-ray comes back and there's no fracture or dislocation and nothing exotic on the x-ray, 
they're going to stop looking for answers about that person's pain. They're just going to give them what I call the clinical dismissal, which is they're going to shoo them out the door with a prescription for painkillers or anti-inflammatories, another for muscle relaxants, and a recommendation to rest or immobilize the painful area. And so this is kind of where the problem lies. It's from that three-step process, but the underlying idea there is what really creates the problem, which is that pain is not a serious problem. Mm. Now, there are some people who might disagree with you there and say, well, this is, this is big business, right? There's over 1 billion people on the planet of our population of, I think it's, what is it, seven or 8 billion people now? I yes. think there's something like 1.5 billion people suffering from chronic pain. That's so correct. there is a massive financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies to be interested in pain and to want to provide answers to pain. Yes. Why, so why is, so it seems to me that at least some of what they're doing, I, I mean, some aspects of conventional medicine, the pharmaceutical co companies are absolutely interested in trying to help people with chronic pain. But what, so, so what's up with that? Uh, I, I don't like to go down the road of conspiracy theories, generally speaking. Uh, but uh, when you talk about financial incentives, there was some really nasty research that came out in 2016 from a, a few professors at the University of Colorado at Boulder that showed that taking opioids, which is this pandemic problem that people in the United States have come to know really well over the past few years, um, actually makes pain worse and longer lasting after just taking them for five days. So it's this really nasty self-perpetuating thing where you take a drug to supposedly solve a problem and the drug actually not only perpetuates the problem, but makes the problem worse. And there's Wait, some... how, how is that? I mean, people can take a painkiller, an mm -hmm. opioid especially, and feel that it is absolutely working to reduce their pain level. So yeah. what, what do you mean when you're saying it makes them worse? So the, the researchers at the University of Colorado at Boulder actually found that it made pain signals get worse. It intensified pain signals in the body. Uh, amazingly, I didn't know that they had a concrete explanation for this. I have a theory, which I'm happy to share with you, which is that the body is a remarkably smart organism. And when it does things, it generally does those things on purpose. So if there is an underlying problem that your body is sending these pain signals, these warning signals uh, to get you to do something about it, let's, let's give an example. Let's say you have your hand on a hot stove, okay? This is a very extreme example. You have your hand on a hot stove, you take a drug to cover up the pain that you're feeling because your hand is on a hot stove. Well, your body being as smart as it is, it's gonna come up a w a with a way to, to find a way around the, the, your attempt to block those signals because it's, prime directive is self-preservation. It's trying to keep you alive. It's not going to let you do something that damages your survivability. And that's where I think that, uh, that increase in pain levels uh, from taking opioids with chronic pain stems from. So over time, so, uh, so these opioids work to kill pain or to, to prevent you from sensing the, the sensation of pain transiently for after some you take people. them. For but, some then people. but then you're saying over time, over days and weeks of taking it, it's, it's making it worse because the body's doing what exactly to increase the sensation of pain? Well, the body's uh, in, engaging in one of the, it's, it's basically hypersensitizing your pain receptors. It's called sensitization and it's basically the root cause of chronic pain. In other words, uh, your hand is on the hot stove and your body's saying, uh, hey, I think you should get your hand off this stove. And then you don't listen or you take a drug to cover it up. And then it goes, hey, I'm pretty sure you should get your hand off this stove. You cover it up a little bit longer. And then it starts screaming at you to get your damn hand off the stove. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. So like the, the, the signals through the, the nerves it, into the, the, the pain sensing, the nociception part of the brain are yeah. actually, you're saying they're actually, those signals are getting stronger? I'm saying that the, the pathways that carry those signals like a, a road that is designed to accommodate more traffic will become wider in the number of lanes that it has so that it can carry more traffic up so that it's, it can ram that signal because your body's basically saying, hey, dummy, get your hand off the stove. So Got your it. body actually increases the number of roads leading to the brain and the size of those roads.
Mm -hmm. Now, what about non-opioid uh, painkillers, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Yeah. Why, yeah. why are those, are those a, a good solution to the problem of pain? There's actually, there's a ton of information that's come out about that. Those are still the number one prescription from medical doctors for people suffering with chronic pain, at least in the United States. Um, so I, I want to state that, that we don't have research on that from all over the world. But here, that's the number one number one prescription. And uh, there was one great quote from a, a famous pain researcher who reviewed all of the literature on chronic back pain and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And he said emphatically, there is no evidence to show that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are helpful in back pain or sciatica. So that was the, the short answer. Okay. So again, just so it's no evidence to support that it's effective. Again, we, we can all experience if we take these painkillers, they do give transient relief. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is over time, there's no evidence that these things are helpful in actually resolving the pain. Yeah. In fact, over time, they're responsible for a lot of problems. They, uh, there's been plenty of studies that show that they downregulate collagen synthesis and actually weaken connective tissue in the body and that this could lead to increased pain, certainly increased likelihood of being injured. And that just as a side effect, they're responsible for, uh, according to the American Journal of Medicine, over 100,000 hospitalizations each year and over 16,000 deaths. So some pretty scary side effects. Um, a lot of downside and not much upside, I think we could say. Okay. So what about, I mean, is, is conventional medicine doing, are, are, I mean, it, let's say somebody has chronic back pain, chronic neck pain, something like that. They go to their conventional doctor. You're saying they're likely to basically get a brief examination of the area, you know, a physical assessment of some kind to see, hey, is there, are there any lumps or noticeable uh, physical changes in this area that could explain this pain. They might get an x-ray. Yes. Uh, and, then, and then what typically happens? Oh, they're going to be sent home with that prescription for anti-inflammatories or, or, or generally they'll start with anti-inflammatories. And if they don't get the result with something like that, they'll, they'll proceed on to opioids. If they don't get the result with that, then they'll proceed to a cortisone shot or some kind of an epidural. Okay. And what, so what, I guess, what, what do you think is wrong with that? And what do you think they should be doing instead? Well, the, the big problem with it is that they are so focused on the pain that they're completely neglecting the fact that the body created the pain for a reason. The pain is not there for fun or by random chance. Uh, the body is producing pain because it's trying to let you know, like the example from before, that your hand is on the stove. So maybe instead of just covering up the pain that's being created by your hand being on a stove, we should figure out why the body is producing that pain and, and focus our attention there. I, I like to use the example very often uh, with my patients about the check engine light in your car. And conventional medicine seems to focus so much on the light that they completely neglect uh, the thing that's going wrong with your car that led to that light coming on. And, and that's where I think the focus needs to be. So you're, bas you're basically saying that chronic pain is like a check engine light in the car and basically painkillers are the equivalent of if they just went in and, and the car mechanic basically chopped the wire to, uh, to the little light for the check engine light and said, hey, well, we turned off that light. You can no longer see that light um, that says check engine. And so we fixed the problem. Actually, I would say that it, it's... it's much simpler than that. They're just putting a piece of black tape over the light. Although there are some pain management specialists who will actually go in and clip the nerves that transmit pain in some chronic pain patients. Now that's like reaching behind the dashboard and, and ripping out the wires. And amazingly, the body still finds a way to transmit pain signals. Just think of somebody who's had a, a limb amputated and then you have things like phantom limb pain. Mm -hmm. So the body finds a way to send these signals and it, it will not be stopped. You have to figure out what the problem is. You can't cover it up with tape and you can't rip out the wires that, 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 that send those signals because the body will find a way. Okay. So conventional medicine largely seems to assume chronic pain issues. The majority of cases are there for random reasons. And basically they're just giving, they're saying rest and here's some painkillers to prevent your brain from sensing the pain so much. Um, you're saying 
that pain is intelligent. It is an intelligent signal of your body communicating to you that something is wrong and needs to be fixed. Well, it's exactly like the check engine light in the car. It's a warning signal. It's okay. a warning signal that something's wrong and it's sending those signals to your conscious brain to get to your conscious awareness to get you to enlist you to get help to change your environment or 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 what's going on if your hand is on a stove you need to get your hand off that stove um if you're in uh, if you're standing on uh you know burning concrete you need to go and find shade and, and get your feet off of that burn it's causing cellular damage, which leads to an increase in what are called nociceptive signaling in the body, which are noxious sim, uh, signals that are letting you know that, that, that uh, the potential for harm exists or that harm is already being done. And it's trying to get you away from that harm. All it's trying to do is preserve self. Mm. That's it. It, it. it really comes down to that. Okay, so your analogy of like, let's say the hand on the stove or standing on something that's burning you, I get it. Um, I even get it, let's say somebody sprains your ankle, it swells up, you have pain. You could see that as intelligent, sort of letting you know, hey, maybe don't use your ankle right now so much. Um, but that's actually different. That's, a, that's acute pain and that pain is coming from cellular damage. Okay. Chronic pain, chronic pain is very different from acute pain in that the vast majority of those pain signals do not come from cellular damage. And it's critically important to make the distinction between acute pain and chronic pain. Uh, non, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and even opioids may very well have a place for acute pain. It might be a very humane thing to do for somebody, but it's definitely not humane to take somebody with chronic pain whose pain has been proven not to be coming from cellular damage and put them on those kinds of solutions. It's, it's unscientific. Okay. So what are these pain signals communicating uh, in, in the context of chronic pain? What, what is going on and what's, what is our body trying to communicate to us when we're sensing chronic pain, chronic back pain, chronic neck pain, shoulder pain, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I think it's important that we differentiate here. Um, when we're talking about chronic pain, we're focused specifically on the most common forms of chronic pain. The most common form of chronic pain far and away is back pain. Okay, so out of those one and a half billion people worldwide that are suffering with chronic pain, it's something like 540 million of them are back pain patients, okay, or back people that suffer with back pain. They, they might not be patients. So Second place is a tie between headaches and migraines and neck pain. And then third place, you get into like joint pain issues. So these are the things that we're talking about when we talk about these issues. So I, I think it's important to set the record straight on that. We had some people uh, on the webinar asking about very... Uh, now, we, just for everybody listening, we recorded a webinar uh, yesterday. And so that's what Yoni's referring to here. Mm -hmm. And so we had some people asking about some very exotic, uncommon pain conditions. And what we're saying may not apply directly to their situation. So we're, we're, te we're speaking about the overarching issue of chronic pain. And right. I, I just want to be clear about that. Rather than specifically like an autoimmune induced ankylosing spondylitis or, Absolutely. or something Absolutely. like that. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's, it's a very unique situation and it's certainly not anywhere in the top 10. Got it. Okay, so again, what, what are these, in the context of, let's say, chronic back pain, chronic mm -hmm. neck pain, what are these pain signals trying to communicate to us? What is wrong? Well, generally speaking, if you're speaking about people in modern society that have adopted a modern lifestyle, it's important that we know going into it that there's huge differences in pain, chronic pain incidents, specifically back pain, the most common form of pain in the world, between people that are living a modern lifestyle and people that are living a more traditional lifestyle to the point where people living a modern lifestyle have like 200 to 400% the amount of back pain. So what I look to is, well, what are we doing differently than people that are living a more traditional lifestyle? And there's a few things that jump out at me. Number one, we're way more sedentary. We don't move as much as we're supposed to. Number two, we sit way more than we're supposed to. We don't move around as much. So sedentary is part of it. Then being seated is part of it. And then one part that I talk a lot about in, in the program, in the pain fix protocol, is what I call flexion-based activities. 
And this is activities where you're seated, usually with your head down and your arms out in front of you. Think of texting or working on a laptop computer or commuting to and from work. These are flexion-based activities. Flexion meaning forward bent. Think of fetal position when I say flexion-based activities. So any position that's moving you towards fetal position. These flexion-based activities, these fetal position activities have been uh, have become a major part of what it means to be a part of modern society. Okay. And so what are they, what are they doing to us? What's the, the net result of that? Essentially it's a structural de-evolution. So when we're born in the world, we come into, we, we come into this world in fetal position and we are completely non-functional. We're completely dependent on mom and dad or our caretakers for Everything, all of our basic needs have to be fulfilled by another person because this is literally the least functional structure that you could ever have as a human being is this fetal position. Then, lo and behold, now you have a young daughter and so you know this very well, as that curve in their neck starts to come in, they become way more functional. So what happens is that that curve in the neck starts to come in, it starts forming somewhere around you know four months of life, and then, and then it'll continue forming until they're about a year, year and a half. And, um, and what happens with that is they can now visually access their environment. So they can turn their head, they can spot mom or dad, which is you know uh, food and shelter and safety and comfort, which is a big deal. It also leads to being able to reach and grasp things so they can start actually um, exploring their world a little bit more. Then the next thing that happens, so that's the first thing that takes us out of that flexion base, that, that fetal position, we get the curve in our neck. Next curve that comes in is the lower back, that's the secondary curve, which starts to come in right around that year mark, and then what happens? Well, they start standing up and, and picking themselves up onto things and moving that little sideways shuffle along, uh, along the couch. And so you can see that as these secondary curves start to come in, they become way more functional and way less dependent on others to fulfill their basic needs. And then what happens is the next secondary curve that comes in starts forming around four or five is the arch in the bottom of the foot. And this leads to running, jumping, skipping, bounding. So they become way more functional. And in a hunter gatherer sense, this is when they would really start to become functional members of the tribe. Okay, and so that secondary curve formation is completed right around age 13, when a lot of rites of passage rituals happen in, in uh, traditional civilizations. And so this person would then be considered a structurally, functionally, a functional member of the society, and they would be engaged in, this, in the activities that that society engages in. But it's based on functionality, which is, we can tell how functional they are by the structure. Now, really interesting, you will reach your peak of functionality when those curves are fully formed and then you have the musculature to really support them. Now we have research that shows that the more these curves begin to deteriorate, the more we lose that structure, the more we revert back into that flexion-based fetal position, the more we uh, lose functionality and really basic stuff that most people don't even notice for years because it just happens so slowly and incrementally over time that it just chips away at your basic functionality. And then lo and behold, you get into your 30s, 40s, or 50s, and you can't turn your head to look behind you in the car when you back out of your driveway and you think to yourself, God, when did that happen? Or I hear this all the time. I can't put my shoes and socks on anymore. <laughs> Jeez, when did that happen? It used to be easy. I can't get down and up off the floor anymore. That used to be easy. I mean, people are shocked by it because it creeps up so slowly and it's really nasty. And by the time those curves are really lost and you get into this, what I call posture prolapse syndrome, where you've lost your secondary curves, well, you also lose the corresponding functionality that comes with those curves. So if you think back to that little baby that first learned how to turn its head, posture prolapse syndrome, they lose the ability to turn their head. But there's nasty stuff too, like your lung capacity decreases. You cannot oxygenate your tissue the way that you're supposed to. You can have it reduced by as much as 30%, which is crazy. It's like living your life uh, at the top of a ski mountain, you know, at an uh, elevation of 11,000 feet. If you've got really bad posture prolapse syndrome, it can cut your lung capacity by a third. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a crazy way to live. Yeah. I want to come One of the I things wanna... that you, oh, go ahead. 
Yeah, I want to come back to that point later because it obviously relates massively to energy levels. If you're not pulling in enough oxygen with each breath and you're not bringing that oxygen to your mitochondria and your cells in your mitochondria are going to be chronically and subtly starved of oxygen on a daily basis throughout the day at a to a slight degree. It's not like holding your breath where you can immediately feel it. It's like a subtle oxygen starvation that's happening all the time. Yes. Um, obviously very important to everybody listening who's interested in energy levels. But I, I want to, I, I, there's something that you're saying here that's, that's really profound. And I want to almost paint the picture visually because I'm not sure that everybody follows exactly what you're explaining with the curvature. But so when we're babies, we're starting with a spinal curvature that's like a C. Basically, it's, it's, it's sort of, I mean, for people who are listening and not watching the video, it, it's sort of like a slight C, like letter C. Okay. C shape curve. That's exactly right. Okay. And then as we develop, first the neck curve comes in here, up here. It's hard to do with my hand here, but um, the neck curve comes in. So we start to develop a curve there that pulls us out of that C. And then a, a few years later, we get that low back curve. Oh, one year later. One year later. Yeah. And then we get the the other secondary curve in the in the feet. Yes. And then you're saying for most people living in the modern world, when we get into 30s, 40s, and beyond, people are actually going in the other direction now. You start going from the S curve back to the baby's C curve. Well, so yeah, it's it, it's it's actually really interesting, and I want to just make a correction there. So it used to be that there was something called a uh, reading neck or scholar's neck, which would develop in people in their say 60s, 70s, 80s, who had spent a lifetime in academics pursuits with their head buried in a book. And they would have this posture that we've come to know as text neck. And you just said that we start to see it in people in their 30s and 40s, which is absolutely true of our generation. But with this new generation that's being raised on this technology, these, smartphones and tablets and laptop computers that weren't around when we were kids, we're actually seeing this in children nowadays. So you don't have to get, we're actually seeing it interfere with the process of developing the proper secondary curve in the first place. Wow. So it's not like they had the secondary curve and then they're training themselves out of it as we see with older people. It's that they never formed the proper secondary curve in the first place. Okay, so, but point taken. But for most people listening to this who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, mm -hmm. um, these are people who, you know, I, I just want to point out, I guess, how common this is. I think it's 80 plus percent of people living in the modern Western world yeah, so have, the most have recent, this going on. The, the most recent research uh, on uh, prevalence showed uh, over 85 percent. Okay. So almost everybody listening to this has moved from their optimal spinal curvature, which they achieved in their teens and 20s, um, and has now moved slowly over the years and the decades in the direction of the spinal curvature of a baby. Mm -hmm. And just to connect the dots for people, that is linked with what? That causes what issues? Well, I mean, it, if you take it to an extreme, it, it leads to oxygen deprivation. It leads to inhibited movement, uh, which is the first sign of it. it. Inhibited motion will show up way before pain. So difficulty moving, difficulty turning your head, difficulty bending and twisting. You have a lot of people complaining of popping and clicking in the neck. Pain is, of course, one of the one of the things that you're going to see in these people. Uh, a lot of tension in the in the uh, upper back and base of the neck, because one of the things that happens as that head shifts forward is it actually becomes functionally heavier. So if you imagine like holding a dumbbell and you hold it in really close to your body, say I have a ten pound dumbbell here, but then if I extend it out here and I'm trying to hold it up like that against gravity, that ten pounds feels a heck of a lot heavier, right? Well, the same thing happens with the head as that head pushes forward. It actually gains gains 10 pounds of weight for each inch of forward motion. So it's incredibly straining on the muscles of the neck and the back and really the whole body. It's exhausting. It's one of the main things that's linked with chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, and uh, and that's, been, um, that's been reinforced time and time again. It's got that breathing difficulty like we talked about earlier. You mentioned fibromyalgia and that there was one quote from a researcher you mentioned in the webinar 
That's right. Uh, yesterday on fibromyalgia, it, it's amazing. Say say this say this quote on fibromyalgia. So I'll I'll paraphrase because I don't remember the, the the whole quote, but it's it's that the majority of head, neck, jaw, shoulder, and back pain in uh, chronic uh, fatigue and immunodeficiency syndrome and fibromyalgia patients was attributed to the head and neck posture of the sufferer. Mm. So head and neck posture was the major factor. That's leading to these. Uh, that's leading to these hypersensitivity pain conditions with these people. And which so is which is an important point because so much of the people that I've seen talking about fibromyalgia are talking about it purely from a biochemical perspective. Yeah. And there is there are researchers out there basically saying, hey, the majority of this pain is actually coming from a physical structural issue. This is not just a biochemical problem. Well, I would say that we 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 tend to get ourselves into trouble anytime any one of us starts thinking about things from one standpoint. There's no reason why it couldn't be helped by both of those things. So my feeling is why not do everything possible to help yourself get better, regardless of what problem you're having. Absolutely. Um, now there's also a study. So the, 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 there's a whole bunch of research linking this process of sort of the, the D development or undevelopment you know, we have this development, developmental phase of the, the, the curvatures of the spine coming in. And then as we're getting older, we're losing that um, yeah, and going like back a, to the baby. A structural de-evolution. De-evolution. So yeah. as we're losing that, all those issues you just mentioned, and then there's also functionality later yeah. in life. And there's a whole bunch of research on that I would love for you to talk about. And the mind-blowing stuff around risk of disease and all cause mortality around lifespan and longevity. Yeah. So you actually bring up a really interesting point. So when I talk about posture prolapse syndrome, what I'm looking for, especially when I treat this stuff in the clinic is what I call diagnostic triangulation. And it's like triangulation that you would use on a map or to, to, to find your way. If you're, if you're kind of lost, you're looking for three points of reference. And so what I'm looking for when I treat these conditions, and one of the things that I talk about over and over again in the pain fix protocol is how to figure out if you have this problem or not. And so, of course, you want to look at the structure. If your head is sticking way out in front of your shoulder, if it's way out of normal position, that's a pretty strong indicator. And it's one data point. But I also want to know what is your functionality like? Because guess what? A neck that's in the proper position moves the way a neck is supposed to move. It's like a wheel. A wheel that's round rolls properly. A wheel that is not round, say it has one flat edge, well, it doesn't roll properly. Same thing with the neck, okay? And then the last thing that we wanna use for our three points is symptoms. So is there pain? Is there stiffness? Is there popping and clicking? Is there chronic tension? And then when you get into the severe symptoms of long-standing postural uh, dysfunction like you're talking about, then there's some pretty scary stuff like um, diminished quality of life, uh, real structural deformity, early onset of uh, arthritis and degeneration, and then you get into increased incidence of all types of nasty stuff like atherosclerosis and pulmonary causes, and even one and a half times uh, the risk of all cause mortality, which means that people with severe posture prolapse syndrome are one and a half times more likely to die from anything and everything. Yeah. This, some of this research you share with me blew my mind on atherosclerosis. It was like one, I actually want to bring up this data. If it I was 250% uh, for atherosclerosis and 200% and for pulmonary causes. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, in, so massively increasing your risk of atherosclerosis and, and heart disease, massively increasing your risk of pulmonary related diseases. These are major causes of death and massively increasing your risk of all, your, your all cause mortality by, uh, by 1.5 fold. Um, I mean, these are just massive increases in your risk of dying associated precisely with this degeneration, this de-evolution of the spine. One thing I want to mention that's really funny actually is one of the studies that you shared with me um, showing these, these massive increases in, um, in disease and all cause mortality associated with this de-evolution of the spinal curvature was took place in Rancho Bernardo. That was the setting for yes. the population they studied. And uh, what's funny about that for everybody listening is Yoni and I, our, our parents, live in Rancho Bernardo. <laughs> so we were joking around, oh, mom, dad, sorry, you guys are screwed. 
if, if you better correct your spinal curvature because people living in Rancho Bernardo specifically <laughs> have massive, massively increased risk of, of disease and dying from any cause if you have screwed up posture. Yeah, I mean, just going back to what we were just talking about in functionality too, there was a really cool study that came out of a university in Brazil in 2014, I believe, that talked about uh, using functionality as a means of predicting longevity. So they, did, de they developed a specific test that uh, determined a person's ability to get down and up off the floor without using your hands. And they actually codified it uh, to pr accurately predict longevity. So if you use your one support uh, from your hand or your elbow, they take down a certain number of points and they actually, the more support that you need to get yourself down and up off the floor, the more it chips away at your longevity. Now, there's a really interesting research that shows that people with posture prolapse syndrome have extreme difficulty getting down and up out of a chair. So all this research has been done and what I tried to do with the pain fix protocol is give a common story to all of it, to put it all into one place and, and link the gaps that exist between that research. Yeah. So speaking of that, that's a nice segue into connecting the dots between everything you just explained, the de-evolution of these spinal curvatures. You talked about all the, the links, lung capacity, increased risk of numerous diseases, increased risk of dying from any cause associated with mm -hmm. these, these exact, this exact spinal curvature that 85 plus percent of the population has. Yeah. And now I want to tie this back into pain specifically. Mm -hmm. So tell me how this pro posture prolapse syndrome and this de spinal curvature de-evolution yeah. is now tied in with what we we're talking about at the beginning with so, pain. Yeah, 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 I got you. So here's the thing is as you're approaching those really nasty long-term health outcomes, Posture prolapse syndrome is ruining your functionality and it's ruining your quality of life along that whole spectrum from wherever you're starting. Say you're starting in your 30s, 40s, or 50s. It's ruining your quality of life and your functionality and your ability to do the things that you love. And it's chipping away at your ability to be a productive member of society and play with your kids and go, go on skiing trips and do all that kind of stuff. Or just wipe your butt. Or just wipe your butt or get down, get down and up off the floor. Uh, but, uh, but so what's happening is you're moving away from health. You're moving away from, from optimal, from where you're supposed to be. And those chronic pain signals, what I find in practice and, and the model that I've used for the last 15 years are those pain signals are put there intelligently to warn you that you're heading towards a cliff that you're gonna fall off the cliff, you're gonna get to those nasty health outcomes, and your body's giving you advanced warning so that you have time to do something about it before it's too late. Now the problem is, in modern society, we've normalized this crazy lifestyle. And so in the, in the webinar yesterday, I talk about the SeaWorld analogy, where you go to see Shamu at SeaWorld and you see that fin flopped over and you're like, Hmm, that's weird. That doesn't look normal. Well, yeah, it doesn't look normal. Uh, marine biology experts state that less than 1% of wild orca whales have their fin flopped over. The only known uh, event of that happening, this was absolutely fascinating, was a pair of orcas um, that were exposed uh, to an oil spill from the Exxon Valdez. Mm. That's the only known incidence of seeing, uh, to my knowledge, only known incidence of seeing fin collapse in the wild. And those two whales died shortly after they were spotted. Wow. That's probably, I would guess it's, you know, it a result of some of those toxins maybe interfering with the ability to form the collagen matrix or something like that. Yeah, or it's just like a, a flower, you know, think of a sunflower and, uh, that's not getting enough water or, or you're pouring motor oil in the soil and it's soaking up into the roots of that thing. That thing's going to start wilting. It means that it's either not getting the nutrients that it needs or it's being poisoned by something. Mm -hmm. So we have this toxic lifestyle in modern society with all these flexion-based activities and not enough extension upright based activities where we're moving around to counteract them. So our lives are dramatically out of balance. You know, we see the same thing with our eyes nowadays, where we spend so much time looking at things close up. And so we're engaging this one set of muscles and distorting our eyeballs to take on a very specific shape so that we can see 
things or that screen. are close up. Yeah, but we're losing our ability to see far away because the eyes become permanently distorted. So it's amazing. You're seeing the same thing in whole body structure, the same thing in killer whales, the same thing in our eyes. They're not separate things. When you so see- just, just for people who didn't get that connection, so this, this fin collapse disorder in orcas, how does that relate to humans? Oh, humans? because it only happens in captivity. You know, less than 1% of wild orcas have this problem, but in, in captivity, it's estimated that uh, as much as 100%, especially when you're talking about the male uh, killer whales with their larger dorsal fins. So you take them out of their natural environment, you stick them in this uh, artificial, super weird environment where they can't do what they do in the wild, and their structure changes. Well, the same thing is happening to humans on a large scale basis. It's just happening to those of us that live in modern, technologically advanced societies way faster than it is uh, with people that live in less technologically advanced societies. And you know what? The pain incidence around the world supports that fact over and over again. Mm -hmm. One more layer of this that I want to tie into this that I think is really important for everybody listening who's interested in energy and who is chronically fatigued, uh, and who may be dealing with things like anxiety and depression, which, which commonly overlap with, uh, with fatigue, as does chronic pain, um, is this interaction of um, increased nociception, increased pain sensation and pain sensing activity in the brain, and how that ties into mood and kind of um, the, 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 the sympathetic nervous system and like makes you prone to anxiety and, and that sort of thing. Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Uh, yeah, but I think it's easier if I just tell a story about it. Imagine that, that, that you're, uh, working on, on something in your office and somebody comes around behind you and goes, fire, there's a fire, there's a fire. It's going to freak you out. Right. And it's going to rattle you and it's going to stress you out and your heart rate is going to jump up and it's going to change your hormonal profile and it's going to change the areas of your brain that are lit up and you're going to go into stress mode. Well, now just imagine that that's happening all the time on a low level. And that's what happens in the body with this. Basically, the body detects that you're headed towards a cliff. It's like, hey, something bad is going to happen. I'm going to start sending warning signals. And so you're getting these fire alarm check engine light signals that are coming to you constantly and it doesn't allow your brain to function properly. It doesn't allow your, your, you, you can't be happy because even if you're not having conscious pain, there's something, those nociceptive signals are actually subconscious. They're happening on the subconscious level. So if your hand is on that hot stove, that thing we've been talking about, you don't actually need conscious intervention to get your hand off of that. That reflex happens without you uh, without your conscious participation in it. Thank God that, 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 that we have that feedback loop that makes that happen really quickly, but we don't have a genetic defense against being in uh, flexion-based activities all day long because it's such a new thing in human history. We just, we haven't built up any defense against it. Got it. Now, I want to tie this into um, Dr. Robert Navio's research on the cell danger response and the mitochondria. And that our mitochondria are stress sensors. There's a whole bunch of research showing that physical stressors, whether it be over-exercise, whether it be the kind of physical stressors that my brother's talking about here, um, with being in this type of posture that results in chronic sensation, chronic pains, chronic aches, um, and chronic activation, this is that those chronic pains and aches are sending signals to your brain, so your brain can sense that pain. And uh, as well as biochemical stressors, toxins, um, and psychological stress, there's a whole field called mitochondrial psychobiology. I've, I've interviewed uh, researcher Dr. Martine Picard on this subject before showing psychological stress directly interacts with our mitochondria. And we have Dr. Robert Navio's research showing that whenever there is a source of these danger signals, these threat signals, like you're giving the example of here with how chronic pain is sending these danger threat signals to the brain, That is sending a signal to the mitochondria to shift out of energy mode into defense mode, into fatigue mode. So there's a there's a an elaborate connection here between chronic pain, increased firing of the the pain reception areas of the brain, shifting you more into uh, sympathetic nervous system dominance, making you more likely to feel negative emotional states, 
more likely to be fatigued, more in, in this kind of vicious cycle of pain, anxiety, stress, irritability, stress mode, and fatigue mode, and making it harder for you to feel positive emotions and for you to feel energetic. That's exactly right. It's, yeah. it's a whole body phenomenon. You can look at it at the level of the mitochondria. You could look at it at the level of the brain. You could look at it at the level of the structure. You could look at it at the heart. You could look at hormonal profiles, but it's one system at the end of the day. And, and, and generally speaking, the whole system heads in the same direction together. Either you're headed towards health and balance or you're headed towards that cliff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So for people interested in, in energy specifically, I just want to connect the dots. We have this decreased lung capacity and chronically limiting the amount of oxygen getting into your mitochondria, shifting your nervous system also into uh, sympathetic dominance, just as a result of this type of spinal curvature. If you also have chronic pain as, at the same time, which is likely because they, this, this spinal curvature is very much linked with chronic pain, then you have now two different sources of how this drives, these physical structural issues drive fatigue. Um, at the same time, we've got the research linking it with massive increases in chronic pain. We've got the research linking this with massive disability and decreased functional ability later in life, decreasing your health span, your lifespan uh, um, of the years where you're actually in good health and good functionality, and your lifespan more broadly, your risk of major killers like cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality as a result of being in this spinal curvature. So yeah. I just want, I want to paint that picture for everybody, connect the dots of everything we've talked about. And now I want to ask you... Oh, let me just add one thing to that, what you were yeah. just talking about. How good of a mood would you be in if you were carrying a 30-pound weight on top of your head and upper back all day long? <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> Not it, a good one. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's it's literally the head becoming 10 pounds heavier for every inch that it shifts forward. This is a major factor in fatigue and in mood. Um, not only that, but there's been, uh, there was a phenomenal Ted talk. I can't remember the name of the researcher, but she talks about power pose and how it changed hormonal profiles in the body, specifically testosterone levels and perceived levels of confidence, um, based on how you were standing. So just imagine you're standing in horrible posture or seated in horrible posture and then multiply it out by decades. Mm. And you want to tell me that those, the, those, the hormones that you're secreting in the, neuro, the neurotransmitter profile that you have inside your body stacked up over 20, 30, 40 years doesn't add up. Yes, it does. As far as fatigue goes, how about holding a dumbbell out in this position all day long for 30 years? Mm. That's pretty exhausting. And yeah. you know what? It's going to make you pretty darn cranky. So it's amazing the change in mood that you see with people just by changing their body position. Or yeah. how about if you're if you have somebody pinching your nose all day long and you can't breathe properly and you're not able to oxygenate your cells? It's not enough to cause you to pass out. It's just enough to make you really miserable. You don't want to smile and laugh as much if you're feeling miserable. Yeah. I also want to connect the dots. There's some research that's come out linking certain neck posture issues and postural issues more broadly with chronic fatigue syndrome. Raymond Perrin uh, discovered this a long time ago and a lot of his research around chronic fatigue syndrome was based on the fact that he sort of accidentally cured someone with chronic fatigue syndrome by uh, fixing their, he, noticing that they had uh, this, this postural issue, hyperkyphosis of the upper back and, and forward head posture and addressing it. And he noticed that the person's fatigue was basically f resolved as a result of it. And so there's, there's a lot of research happening along those lines right now. Um, so we've connected the dots, mood and quality of life, energy levels, quality of life, quantity of life as well, and uh, pain, of course, which also relates to quality of life. This is just, it's, it's a massive factor in both quantity and quality of life. So we've got this posture prolapse, prolapse syndrome that's massively harming our quantity and quality of life. What the heck do we do about it? How do we actually fix this issue, Yoni? Well, there's a lot of different ways that are, that are out there now. It's, it's, it's really interesting. The awareness of poor posture is probably greater than it's ever been. And you have 50 different proposed solutions going on at any given time. The, the things that have become really popular lately are uh, the posture trainer devices where it looks kind of like a backpack that you wear that pulls your shoulders back for you. Um, not a great solution. 
Uh, we have things like the neck hammock, which we had people asking questions specifically about on the webinar last night. We have uh, inversion tables, which is one of those old go-tos, and then fancy tech things like those little buzzing electronic devices that you stick to your skin. Each one of them has their own sets of problems, but what I would start out with is an understanding of how posture works. So posture is regulated at the subconscious level. We don't need to think about holding ourselves up against gravity. In other words, we're not spending our, 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 our days consciously trying not to fall on our faces. Okay. Thankfully, our body takes care of that at the automatic level, like it does with breathing. Okay. So that's fantastic. It frees up our mind to focus on other things. So when we're correcting posture, it is in our best interest to train it on the same level that it operates. So you can't go to a gym and crank out a bunch of conscious repetitions because it's not going to spill over into that subconscious space where posture operates. So that's important. Second thing that's important is that postural muscles contract and operate what's called isometrically, which means they contract and they stay contracted all day long. They don't uh, contract and relax or flex and extend all day long like say our leg muscles do when they're moving us from here to there. These muscles contract and they stay contracted. So you have to train your postural muscles isometrically for the exact role that they play in the body critically important that the ideal solution for posture requires that next thing posture is regulated actively meaning it's your muscles that are holding you up against gravity so you better have strong muscles to counteract all the flexion based activities because as much as i try with my patients in the clinic i can't get them to stop engaging in flexion based activities so you have to be strong enough to resist them and you have to take frequent breaks but that is all regulated actively. So you gotta be strong enough to resist gravity. That goes without saying, okay? And then finally, you wanna train with progression and progressive uh, overload, which are bodybuilding principles that have been applied for 70 years. These things are absolutely proven fact. If you are used to carrying your body weight plus extra weight. Say you have a kid and you're carrying your kid for a mile long walk, and then you set that kid down and walk another mile. Well, that second mile is gonna feel a heck of a lot easier than the first mile did because you're not having to lug that kid around. So you need progressive overload to train the body to be stronger than it needs to be so that the task that you're asking it to do seems comparatively easy. Mm. Okay. So how the heck do we do all that? So the ideal solution is uh, a product that I've developed called the Active Traction Unit. And what it does is it loads the body in such a way that it subconsciously activates the muscles of your postural uprighting system and puts you into the ideal position to resist the pull of gravity. So it naturally pulls you into that position. If we contrast that with, say, the little electronic buzzing devices that let you know every time you get into a flexion-based posture, those only work as much as you're consciously aware of them. And so the moment you lose your conscious awareness, say you're focused on writing a really important paper or a presentation that you need to do at work, guess what? Your attention needs to be on that paper that you're writing, and you don't have time to maybe think about maintaining perfect posture while you're in the middle of that project. And so those... Those devices, while I, I do see some benefit to them, they're, they're not uh, uh, going to be a permanent fix on their own because sooner or later, you're going to need to focus your conscious awareness on something other than holding yourself in the ideal position. Mm -hmm. So we developed- you know, what, what about like the, the thing that you mentioned earlier, the, the straps that sort of you know, pull your shoulders back for yeah. you into a more ideal position? What, what's wrong with that? So it's, it, those are actually a huge problem because they're like Spanx right? Uh, you, you take somebody who, who, who can't fit into these kind of clothes or these specific pants and you create all these mesh like compression panels like a corset and stuff them down into this thing uh, unnaturally. So these put you into the position, but they actually offload the tissues that are designed to be holding you up, meaning the strap is doing the work, not the muscles that are designed to help you up, uh, to help hold you up. So uh, what happens is that over time, when you take that strap off, the muscles are actually doing less work while you're wearing the strap. So over time, it actually makes those muscles weaker and will lead to worse posture or total dependence on wearing that device at all times. It'll never pull you into that position and strengthen you there. 
Okay. So what's the difference between those devices and your device, the active traction unit? Well, the active traction unit is naturally pulling you into the right position. It's subconsciously stimulating your uprighting system and to pull you into the ideal position to resist the pull of gravity, but it's using your muscular action to do it. So we're using the concept of progressive overload. So you're using more weight than your body normally has to carry. And then you're increasing the time slowly and incrementally that you wear the device over the weeks that you're using it to pull your neck back into the right position. So it's actively using the muscles of your own body to reposition the curvature of your neck into the ideal shape to resist the downward pull of gravity. And you're getting stronger over time, thereby increasing your ability to maintain that position for life. Okay. So what is, I, I'm, I'm, Obviously, I've been using this thing for years now. I love it. It's made a huge difference for me. But I'm just sort of trying to ask questions from the listener's perspective here, um, sure. even though obviously I have a firsthand experience with all this. But w explain to people what, uh, what this thing looks like and what it's doing and what you do with it. Sure. And explain it as best you can for people who are listening who are not watching this video. Sure. This is an active traction unit, you guys. You can see we have the straps here on the back, Velcro panels that are, are adjustable for head size. There's two of those. There is a very evenly balanced weighted portion at the front of this, which you would wear across the forehead like so. The moment you do that, you're gonna feel a downward pull from your forehead down here. And so your body does intelligently what's called a counter pressure response. So if you were to hold your hand up like this and somebody comes and slams their hand into yours without even thinking about it, you're going to resist that pressure. And so that's what your body does here. You're feeling a pull downward here that's pulling you into this position. And so the body's natural response is to pull up and back. Try and, explain, try and explain that. I know it's difficult, but try and explain it verbally for people listening, not watching the video, what you just said there. So that the head weight is where on your body and it's pulling you where? The head weight is uh, positioned across the forehead as if you were wearing like a baseball cap backwards. Okay. And the weighted portion is centered over the eyebrows. And so what it's doing is it's actually pulling you into a flexion based position. And so the body's response, what I'm calling this counter pressure response, is to pull you into an upright extension-based position. And the neck curve is an extension-based curve. Secondary curves always oppose the, the, the fetal position curve, the primary curve. And so that's what we want to hyper-emphasize to counteract all these flexion-based activities is we need to overemphasize our extension-based activities as a means of creating a counterbalance. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's basically like the opposite of those devices that are passively sort of doing the work for you, pulling your shoulders back for you. That's this exactly is, right. this is actually forcing you to engage that musculature, but not just, it's, it's not just like something buzzing you for like telling you to consciously correct your posture. It's something that is activating un unconsciously the muscles that naturally pull you into a, an optimal posture. Is that that's, accurate? That's exactly right. In the beginning, it may require some conscious awareness because you'll have to stimulate some of the, uh, the joints in your neck to get them to do things that they're not used to doing in order to, for your subconscious to be able to get you into that right position. So it may feel a little bit weird at first, which is one of the reasons why we recommend the training schedule builds people up very slowly. But the one thing I want to go back and mention is one of the big problems with those posture trainer devices, the, those reverse backpacks, is that they target the middle part of the back. And one thing that I should have mentioned is that posture prolapse syndrome is absolutely driven by head position. Okay, so targeting downstream issues will never resolve it. It's very possible to wear one of those posture trainers, have it pull your shoulders back into a beautiful position and for your head to still be forward. They do not affect head position. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and there's a great slide in my presentation that shows somebody wearing them and the guy's in phenomenal shape, but his head is still sticking out three inches in front of his body. <laughs> that's a picture taken from like one of the ads for one of those products. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It does not fix head position. I mean, it doesn't even passively fix head position. 
Yeah. Certainly. And all, all the, the changes, the de-evolution of the spinal curvature you're saying is driven by the forward head posture. Uh, head position drives everything. Head position drives body position. So there's this old saying that where the head goes, the body follows. So if you want to fix... Isn't that a... It, that's a boxing saying, right? <laughs> to like punch people in the head so that oh, they're... <laughs> it's amazing. We, we learned it in martial arts as kids. If you're going to do a spinning kick, the first thing that comes around is your head. Mm -hmm. Gymnasts learn it. Dancers learn it. Um, but it's also a proverb where if you think about or focus on something, that's where your energy flows. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's absolutely true from a literal standpoint. If we, if we take judo training, which you and I have both done, if you control that person's head, you control that person. And so when we're doing posture correction techniques, you got to focus on the head. That's the upstream issue. Everything else, all the downstream stuff takes its commands from what's going on at the head. Got it. So we've got, uh, you know, one other thing I, I would love for you to mention is the spinal molding piece of this puzzle of yeah. posture correction. Do you, do you want to talk a bit about, because I know this is a, another aspect of what you're teaching in the pain fix protocol. And by the way, um, Yoni has mentioned the pain fix protocol for, he's mentioned it a couple times in this podcast for everybody listening. Um, little history here for literally years now, I've been begging Yoni to develop an online program to codify his methods and put it into a format that doesn't require an in-person visit to his office and him physically assessing you and um, put it into an online program to, to be able to, so that basically people all over the world can access these methods to fix their spinal curvature, fix their chronic pain, and fix all the other issues that we talked about as far as you know, the, the mood issues, the quality of life issues, um, energy and fatigue issues, and uh, obviously the increased risk of numerous diseases that are, that's associated with these, this abnormal spinal curvature. Um, so I've been trying to get him to do this for years. He's actually fought me on it for a long time because he's basically said, you know, there's no way I can, I can teach this without me doing physical assessments on every individual. And we eventually got around that um, by creating a set of self-diagnostics. So he's created a whole bunch of videos to guide people through these self-diagnostics to figure out what your specific issues are. And then he's created um, a, a personalized set of pathways that you can go on based on those self-diagnostics that are, that are tailored to your unique issues. Um, and that's the pain fix protocol. So he's just came out with this product. We are literally just releasing it now. Um, this podcast is going out. Today is... March 5th, Thursday. It's going out in two days from now on Saturday, March 7th. The, the registration for pain fix protocol is only going to be available for three days after Saturday, March 7th. So March 10th is when this is going to all close down. And um, once registration closes, I, I also want to mention, uh, since he's my brother, I talked him into giving a hefty discount uh, to followers of the Energy Blueprint. Uh, so the normal price of this program is $500. Everybody who is listening to this podcast who wants in on this program before March 10th, um, you can get it for $200 off the normal price. So it's uh, two, is it two, 297 or 299? It's, it's 299. Okay, 299. Um, so $200 off the normal price. You enter the discount code Energy Blueprint at checkout. Um, this is, you know, again, this is, the person who I am the most close to in my entire life, he's been a personal health mentor of mine. He's a genius at this stuff. Uh, if you can't already tell from everything that he's explained in this podcast, and that's why I've literally been begging him for years to create this program. He's finally created it. This is the first time it's ever being released to the world. Uh, and if you've got chronic pain issues, if you've got energy issues, if you are part of the 85% plus of people who have non-optimal spinal curvature, you need this program. Go get this program. It is, it is that simple. Like that's how strongly I feel about this. Everybody listening to this needs to get this program. <laughs> Unless you are one of the 15%, the, the less than 15% of people who has perfect spinal curvature, fine. Oh, you, you don't know, have to get you this You know program. who those 15% are? 
There are people who have jobs at like uh, national parks as like park rangers where they walk all day long and they spend mm -hmm. no time in flexion based activities. And you know what? I, I've traveled as you have to many third world countries around the world and you see um, people into their 70s and 80s with perfect posture. You see people in their 70s and 80s that can do a perfect rock bottom squat. You see people that are still very physically active and productive members of their society and that we're not seeing that in one of the most technically technologically advanced societies in the world is such a shame and there's no reason why we can't have our cake and eat it too we can have all this awesome technology and use uh, all this tech for the thing that was intended to do which is to make our lives easier and give us more time to do other things like self-care but the fact that it's making us less healthy and less functional is is just an awful an awful uh, thing that's occurred. Yeah, I I was as you were talking there. I was, uh, and I hear I've obviously heard you talk on these issues hundreds of times over the years. But I always think as we're talking about this stuff of um, you know the the Okinawans, one of the blue zones, and you see these pictures of like hundred and two year old women who are sitting on little cushions on the ground who get up and down from the floor. That's right. with, with ease and because they move their body through that structure uh the the those they move their body through those movements up and down from the floor i think it was even counted as something like 30 or 60 times a day yeah um that's uh, likely very likely a big factor in longevity oh and you know I, what i want to jump in there they have almost no incidence of knee or hip osteoarthritis no incidence of hip and knee gener degeneration which are major problems in our society and it comes from disuse yeah, they use their their hips and knees way more. They have squat toilets and they have healthier knees. Yeah, and I also think of you know the pictures of like you see people from African tribes, um, like these these pictures of these beautiful women, you know, with perfectly straight spines and holding like you know a a, a big jug of water on their head and That's just right. walking with this weight on top of their head yeah. with this perfect beautiful posture while carrying a child usually now something really interesting on that this is this is really fascinating you see it in africa you see it in india you see it in indonesia you see it in asia you see it in all these countries that have been uh you know closed off from each other and really there there wasn't necessarily direct trade routes be between a lot of these places and yet all of these places independently figured out that that was the most efficient way to carry things and yet we send our we send our kids off to school with these enormous backpacks and we talked about the counter pressure earlier with the active traction unit well guess what happens if you put a huge load on the back it pulls them backwards and so what the body does is it shoves the head forward and the shoulders forward to counteract that backward pull i mean yeah. that's what always happens it's 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 reaction and counter reaction yeah and as you know i had chronic mid back pain for um, all of my late teens and all of my 20s uh, as a result of probably largely as a result of two things, carrying a backpack so much as I'm going through all my years of school and, and also sitting so much during all these years of school. I mean, we sit our entire lives going to school for, for freaking eight hours a day. Yeah. 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 The worst and then we thing come home did. and we play video games and sit some more. <laughs> the worst thing I ever did for my back was, uh, was go through all the advanced schooling. Yeah. yeah. All that sitting and all that head in the books really does a job on people. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, I want, I, I asked you about spinal molding. I want to make sure you answer that briefly. Okay. We're just, we're just about out of time, but answer spinal molding. Uh, again, I want to let people know about the pain fix protocol, which is being released. There's only a few days from the time people are hearing this podcast to actually get in on it, get the discount. But tell me about spinal molding and then tell me about the whole pain fix protocol and how it's addressing this spinal curvature, spinal de-evolution. So spinal molding really quick, as awesome as the active traction unit is, it is not a complete solution. There are other factors that need to be in there. And so it addresses the muscular system amazingly well. It addresses the curve amazingly well. It targets the brain the way that it's intended to uh, correct and, and, and regulate posture in the body, which is fantastic. But it does not change the length of the ligaments that run along the front and the back of your spine that create stability of the spine and contribute to the shape of your spine. So if you've got really bad, really advanced posture prolapse syndrome, 
there's these two ligaments on the spine that one runs across the front that's called the ALL and one that runs across the back called the PLL that's anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament more information than most people need but when you have uh, posture prolapse syndrome what happens is the curve on the front gets shorter over time because it gets the two ends move closer to each other while the curve on the back becomes longer Okay, so the ligament on the back becomes longer, the ligament on the front is shorter. So when you're trying to go backwards and you've uh, into extension, say looking upward, and you've got really severe posture prolapse syndrome, it's extremely difficult. And one of the things that can be limiting these people is the actual length of the ligament on the front of their spine. So the purpose of spinal molding is to target those ligaments. Now, ligaments operate very differently than muscles in the body. If you pull a muscle apart, it pulls back together. It responds like a rubber band. Ligaments, if you put them into a position and you hold them there long enough, they actually take on that shape, which is fascinating. So spinal molding uses that, uh, what's called plastic deformation to our advantage. It says that you place the curve uh, of the neck into its normal position and you start holding it there over periods of time. And over time, your spine will actually take on that shape. And then so you're affecting the ligaments with the spinal molding, and then you follow it up with the active traction unit to strengthen the muscles to retain that position when you're upright against gravity, and then you get the best, the best changes. Okay. Um, just for people wondering, what does spinal molding actually look like? What are you doing to accomplish that? So it depends on the region of the spine that you're working on, but say we're talking about the neck in this example, what you would do is roll up a towel uh, for the easiest version to a diameter of about three inches. You're going to lay flat on your back, lie flat on your back, excuse me. And then you're going to place that roll towel at the base of your neck, basically where your neck meets your shoulders. And then you're just going to lay back and relax. What you want to make sure is that the back of your head and not the top of your head is in contact with the surface that you're lying on. This and, works and, and people who have, uh, a lot of this prolap posture prolapse syndrome, and forward head posture are likely if when they get in that position, they're, they're more likely to have more of the top of their head and less of the back of their head touching the ground, right? Yeah. So people with posture prolapse syndrome are way more likely to have the top of their head in contact with the floor than the back of the head. In fact, they'll be physically unable sometimes to even get their head into contact with the floor because as that head shifts forward, what happens is everything is searching for balance in, in the body. And so when that head shifts forward, it becomes heavier and heavier. The body actually intelligently shifts the middle back curve outward to counterbalance that weight but as it shifts outward it tends to become stiffer and stiffer as well because having that head in forward position is actually puts you at risk for falling on your face so what the body does is it kind of locks down the other the other parts of your spine to prevent you from basically falling it's a self-preservation mechanism so as that middle back locks down, your ability to bend backwards, what's called going to spinal extension becomes very limited. So if you put that person lying flat on their back on a firm surface, that spine is so rigid like this that it can't flatten out. And so that leads to the head being sometimes with really severe posture prolapse syndrome, they won't even be able to get their head into contact with the floor at all. Wow. And they'll feel extreme stretching here. So is it safe to say that if you have someone lie down on a firm surface, uh, a hard floor, maybe even a carpet, but I think especially a hard floor, and they have the top of their head touching the ground and they might feel like even a, a stretch and some pain from being in that position because straightening, putting the spine in a straightened position is yeah. now causing pain due to how due to their abnormal spinal curvature, is it, is it accurate to say that the more, the more difficult it is for them to be in that position, the more pain they have and discomfort they have being in that position, the worse their spinal curvature is? Uh, I would say that it's one data point and one that I would definitely pay a lot of attention to. In the pain fix protocol, we actually use what's called the flat lying test as a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. So can a person lie flat on their back on a firm surface? Is that easy for you? And can your spine get into the right position when you're there? Uh, if it's difficult for you, or if you're really unable to do it, for sure that's a data point. But then like we talked about in the beginning, you wanna follow it up with that diagnostic triangulation. So that would be a functional finding. Then you wanna look at their structure when they're standing. And then or, you wanna- you, I mean, you're, 
you're saying you want to look at their structure, but you're saying you're what you're actually teaching in the program is yeah, how they can analyze their own structure. There you go. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then and then obviously you would want to key them in on the types of symptoms that you would expect to see when you have those types of data points with uh, uh, diminished uh, functional capabilities and uh, abnormal structure. Then Got you want to say, okay, do we have the symptoms that are also pointing to a posture prolapse syndrome? When you have all three of those, you know for sure you got a posture prolapse. Got it. So we've talked about all this, this whole picture of abnormal spinal curvature, posture, posture prolapse syndrome, all the issues with quality of life, mood, energy problems, sympathetic nervous system dominance, um, fatigue, irritability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the lifespan issues, increased risk of disease, all cause mortality massively going up, um, huge decreases in functionality later in life, loss of functionality, the ability to go for a walk, to play with your grandkids, to wipe your own butt, to go skiing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do everything in life such that you end up you know, walking with a cane or in a wheelchair or something like that. Um, or falling and breaking a hip and having that be the cause of death. And I know you didn't mention it specifically, but I've heard you talk about the research linking this with increased risk of falls and, uh, and all the issues that come with that, which is a major cause of death later in life. Uh, it also increases risk of osteoporosis. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and of course, the risk, the, the propensity for chronic pain is of course massively linked with this whole abnormal spinal curvature issue as well. So the solution you're saying is active traction unit, spinal molding, and what else? Well, the solution really starts with uh, educating yourself. You need to have the knowledge to correctly identify what's going on with you so that you can figure out where those warning signals are coming from, or even better, have enough knowledge to figure it out before the warning signals become really bad. So if you can get it to it and work on it from a prevention standpoint, when you're only working on a functional loss and you don't even have symptoms, that's the best case scenario. Yeah. So the, the thing that I'm trying to accomplish with the pain fix protocol is to empower people to know, number one, what's going on with them. Number two, know that it's actually a problem. And number three, know what to do about it. So with patients in my clinic, I know I've done a good job when a patient, say, goes on a trip around the world for three months, and then they say to me when they get back, oh, yeah, this little thing came on when I, I did something weird and tweaked myself when I, when I was on my trip. But you know what? I knew exactly what to do to fix it. And I'm like, yes, I've done my job. They yeah. were not overseas and, and thinking that this happened to them like a, a being struck by lightning. They figured out what caused it, and then they knew exactly what to do to, how to, to correct it. And that's what I want to do with this program for everyone out there that's suffering with these problems, that's not able to find answers for why they still have these problems or that's tried to resolve the problems and ha has failed. You know, one of the things that I see in my practice is I'm the sixth, seventh, eighth, 10th doctor that these people are seeing. And so none of these functional problems have ever been diagnosed. Nobody's talked to them about their structure. But you know what? People get it. It makes sense. When they see Shamu and that dorsal fin's flopped over, they know that something's wrong. And, and so now it's yet, just- And yet people with chronic pain are going to their, their physicians to have their, their, low, their low back pain, their neck pain, their mid back pain analyzed. And- how many of those physicians are mentioning anything about spinal curvature and structural and postural abnormalities or even know how to assess for it? Well, almost none. It's, it's, it's not even uh, remarked on in most cases with uh, radiological reports. So, so even on x-rays, a loss of curvature is not a, a finding that uh, conventional medicine comments on. Wow. So pain fix protocol. Again, for everybody listening, I've literally been talking my brother into this for years. I also want to say on a personal note, um, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I suffered with mid-back pain. I've had scoliosis since uh, I was a little kid and uh, um, a, a, a leg length discrepancy since I was a little kid that has probably caused the scoliosis. And I had, I suffered through literally 
more than a decade of chronic mid back pain and then chronic neck pain and a huge propensity for um, neck strains and injuries whenever I do my activities, weightlifting, rock climbing, surfing, things like that. And um, this stuff, so I have my, my active traction unit right here, this head weight that I use religiously every day, um, these specific exercises Yoni's taught me, the spinal hygiene exercises that he teaches, uh, and what he's teaching in the pain fix protocol literally fixed my decade of chronic pain. Um, and uh, like, I, I just, I can't be more of a, an evangelist for this program. Um, for everybody listening who, if you're interested in fixing your pain, this is a no brainer. You must get this program. Like I, it's not even a question. If you have chronic pain, get the program. Uh, there's 30 money, a 30 day money back guarantee. If you, uh, if, if you try it and you don't experience massive benefits, all you got to do is send an email asking for your money back. Um, but seriously, if you have chronic pain, just go get this program right now, painfixprotocol.com, uh, order it on there. If you are interested in energy levels, optimizing your energy, if you are interested in longevity and protecting yourself against disease and loss of functionality later in life, which should be everybody listening to this. Like, I mean, if you're not interested in energy and longevity, I don't know why you're here, but um, <laughs> it, like, and if you're part of the 85 plus percent of people that already has abnormal spinal curvature, you need to start working on this if you care about your risk of disease and your longevity and your health span. So I'd also, uh, I'd like to get the people out there that aren't able to do the things that they love to do anymore. That's, that's my favorite thing to work with in the practice. People who say, oh, I, I had a, a, a patient who's a medical doctor for 40 years. He, he's in his late seventies and he says to me, I can't walk with my wife anymore because I have, I'm in too much pain and I have to turn back after a quarter mile and she's sick of me dragging her down. He just said to me when he came in earlier this week, hey, I just walked four miles without stopping and I blew past my wife as we got back to the house and, and he had a huge smile on his face afterwards. And I love those kind of stories. So anybody who just wants to move better, do more and have a higher quality life, get the pain fix protocol. Yeah, absolutely. So painfixprotocol.com, you can grab it on there. Uh, should be easy to find. There's also the active traction unit on there, which you can also purchase. Uh, highly recommend it. People, I, I just so you know, I make no money off of this whatsoever. Um, this is not something I have any vested financial interest in. Uh, this is something that is my brother's program. I, but I have never promoted anything or felt so strongly about anything before other than, than this program. So go get this program. I just think it's, it's a massive hidden key to longevity and good health and energy levels that almost nobody's talking about and almost nobody knows how to address properly. And my brother is literally a genius when it comes to this stuff. Go get this program. Again, the normal price is $500. Right now you can get it for $299 before March 10th by using the code when you're checking out Energy Blueprint. So if you just type Energy Blueprint into the discount code box when you're checking out, uh, it'll knock $200 off your price. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Yoni, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been Thanks years of us talking about you doing this and now it's finally happening. And uh, I just couldn't be more happy for you and, and more, more proud of what you're doing and more excited to see what you're doing. And um, I'm just, I've, I've always been blown away by your genius and it's beautiful to now see you finally sharing it with the world. So thank you for coming on the podcast and, and sharing your wisdom with my audience. Thank you for having me on your show. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go, just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, the energy blueprint, and also Make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview and I will see you again next week.